and welcome to Stop Now, uh, where we stop, listen, and share. I'm JK, your host, and I'm joined by a special guest today, uh, Sarah. Uh, I don't want to butcher your last name. How do I say? Like, pardon me. Spowart. Spowart. Okay, that's nice. Uh, so, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Uh, again, uh, it's quite exciting and uh, uh, your background uh, makes me feel jealous that you are in uh, beach and probably you are in uh, um, Miami Beach. I don't know, but uh, no, I'm in Florida. No, this is a, not a real background. I just like it. <laughs> it's a Zoom background, but I just I just like it. Wonderful. Again, uh, our teammates are there on the background, so they they just wanted to jump in and ask any questions. So before we get into it, right. So for our audience, like if you can introduce yourself, like what do you do? What is your specialty and your life experience? Yeah, absolutely. It's a um, complicated question, just that in itself, but I'll try to make it summarized. Um, I teach at the University of South Florida. I teach global health classes uh, for humanitarian rights. Um, and different uh, issues like humanitarian assistance. Uh, I also teach uh, psychology classes um, at USF at the St. Petersburg campus. So the global health ones are Tampa, those are St. Petersburg. And um, in addition to that, I have my own business called Happiness Learned, which is a basically about um, helping people with wherever they're at learning whatever skills or things they need to get to better better spaces in their life. So um, my background is uh, unusual. Um, I'm finishing my second doctorate right now and I have two um, master's degrees. Um, and I'm also a clinical therapist. Um, I started doing humanitarian assistance work, I mean, even as, as, even when I was a teenager, I, I tried to do stuff. I went to other countries and um, that's when I started. I, I started getting interested more and in becoming more aware of the human trafficking issue um, when I did work in uh, Tanzania and also India and um, also in West Africa and Syria. I was in Syria at one point and it is prevalent everywhere. Um, is a huge problem in the United States as well. And um, I got uh, actively involved with uh, trauma relief, uh, sexual assault services, uh, crisis intervention work in 2016. Um, and that was in Pinellas County that I did that. Um, before that, I did uh, humanitarian assistance work in other countries, but in terms of honing in on, on the human trafficking issue, that started really 2016. Um, and uh, I ended up going to DC at one point. I was there for about a year and a half, two years, and I worked uh, as well for an organization that specialized in helping um, survivors and victims of human trafficking. It's a very complicated issue, and there's a lot of things we don't the, the masses don't understand correctly about it. Um, it's, it's hidden in plain sight, I think is the best way of putting it. But um, it takes different forms uh, anywhere from, I mean, I, I've had clients that were literally like you think in the movies um, chained in basements. Um, but then I've had clients that nobody knows and they just go home and um, they go to school, they get good grades and they're being trafficked by their parents at night. So it's, it's a very um, uh, complicated issue, but at the same time, I do believe that awareness and education about what actually is going on with it is, is crucial for, for stopping it. Wow. Uh, that's an amazing introduction you have done so much and also travel globally and you have this uh, expertise and also you are at the university teaching people so th this is something like uh, we wanted to understand from the experts like you 
uh, sorry if I missed that part, right? You said like uh, you focus on therapy, right? So you you provide counseling and therapy to people who have been traumatized or who have been victim. Is that right? Yeah, and I've also I meant to say too, I am I've published uh, many articles uh, and chapters and books about trafficking about child sexual abuse and how it's all interconnected. So I've also published um, things on these, these items. So I, you could say I am a specialist with trauma and, and violence. Wonderful. Again, Sarah, uh, good to begin with, right? So I will ask some basic questions and also I just wanted to play some devil's advocate here and also uh, ask some hard questions. Again, uh, teammates like uh, Shiva and Amar is there. So you guys can jump in and ask any questions if you need. Uh, but I am going to go ahead and ask uh, Sarah uh, uh, the basics, right? So why is this human trafficking still exist in the modern world? Yeah, so <clears throat> to my knowledge, um, and this is pretty horrifying, we have if I want to translate the word uh, to traffic persons to slaves, we have more slaves today than all of human history combined. Um, and it is, it's very much hidden in plain sight. Um, why do we have it? It's a very fast growing industry. Different reasons. Um, you can make, and this is not to give advice to anyone who wants to make money, this, you can make a lot more money selling um, a child uh, for sex over and over again than selling drugs, for example, or other types of criminal activities. Because with a person, maybe you can sell them five, six, ten times a day, but a drug you only sell once. Um, also, children, and usually they, they target people that are more vulnerable, that have less support. They are, um, there's less consequences. So like, let's say someone is involved in um, other types of criminal activities, you might be dealing with more dangerous people. It's easier to subdue, control children, women, vulnerable populations um, and exploit them. So it's partly because it's become a money-making thing, but at the root of it, it's also the demand. So what we know the bulk actually of human trafficking is labor trafficking. It's not sex trafficking. The, the vast majority of people that are trafficked, you could say slaves, are um, they're doing things like agricultural work, um, gardening, um, even working in hotels, cleaning, nannying, uh, whatever jobs are kind of they're forced to do. Um, they they do, but even though sex trafficking is the minority, if you look at a pie chart, it makes up the bulk of the income from trafficking industry, and it's the fastest growing one. Um, and so, even though it is the minority of trafficked individuals, and there's there are many many trafficked individuals in the world today. Um, tens of millions. Uh, I don't know exact number today, but it's some people think the number is unknown, but it's it's absolutely the it's many, many millions of people. So um, in terms of that, it, they make the most money that way. So it's low consequence, low risk. Um, and that goes to the other side of it, of the law enforcement, is that it's pretty hard. And again, this is not an advertisement to do this, but it's pretty hard to be convicted for trafficking. I actually went on some ride alongs with U.S. Marshals and FBI agents and police um, in D.C. and for the job that I had there. And I remember the FBI telling me it's, it's very challenging to get these people convicted. So even, so they have to gather a lot of evidence. Um, a lot of times the victims are so brainwashed or so traumatized, they won't testify or it's, it's a very hard thing to, to put these people in jail and to really 
get at these operations. The other reason why I'd say, and this is what we found as well in DC, it's growing so much and it's so hard to manage um, is the internet. So um, I know, I think during the Trump administration at the beginning, they took down Backpage um, in an effort to fight this, but it actually, I, I don't think anyone foresaw this necessarily, but it actually caused a lot more problems. Um, because that was a way <clears throat> that people could kind of, apparently they were able to sort of monitor who was, uh, it gave the sex workers more independence. Um, and so they could kind of monitor uh, and, and, and take, like get ratings and talk to other people about the different Johns that um, would come. And so it actually put people at higher risk of being trafficked um, in some strange ways. The other thing is people think, well, once someone's trafficked, that's it. That's that's all. That's not necessarily true. It, it can be that somebody is a sex worker by choice because maybe they're in poverty or they have an addiction or something's happened. And then they get trafficked while being um, a sex worker. And then maybe somehow they get out of it and they try to be a sex worker again because that's how they identify themselves. Um, and then they get trafficked again. So it's not, again, it's not necessarily that someone's just been chained in a basement or something like that. Um, although that can absolutely be, be the case. But the internet has really made this prevalent. Um, the other part, uh, sorry, I'm talking too much. Um, the, the other part of this is um, the mental illness piece. So the United States in particular is a, is a problem with this stuff. Um, I really would love to see some government policies that would address the issue of pedophilia. It's a, it's a major problem. And one of the reasons it's a major problem, the research shows, from a little bit of research that's been done on perpetrators, and we need a lot more, the research shows that when people start engaging in pornography, um, and let's say they become addicted or dependent, or they use it as a way to deal with stress, deal with depression, deal with negative emotions, whatever, it, they get more and more dependent what we've seen is that the stuff that they that would help them feel better early doesn't work as much. And they they lean towards increasingly violent forms and more extreme forms of pornography as time goes on to get, you could say, that same high. And this is where the addiction piece comes in too. And eventually, even very violent stuff is not interesting. And people tend towards um stuff that's really not okay like they know is not okay to get that high with with children and they tor tend towards child pornography and then um that becomes not enough for their high and then they are much more likely to go in person to go seek a child or seek someone who's been trafficked or someone who's very young um and then that becomes not even enough and they want younger and younger so it's very very sick it's very unfortunate, and I really wish the U.S. did um, something because perpetrators from the U.S. go to other countries like Thailand, and they keep this going. So it has to do as well with the rampant mental illness in the United States and addiction issues and the Internet. Um, so there needs to be more awareness of how this is really just in our backyard. Um, in lots of countries. I mean, when I was in India, um, I worked on a, a street children project, very rampant there as well. There was um, a lot of kids that would run away from home because of um, abuse they were experiencing in the household or they were witnessing um, alcoholic fathers. And when the boys would run away, a lot of times they get they go to a big city thinking there'd be some opportunities. And they, what I saw, at least when I worked there, was people would, the children would go to landfills. They will go to um, different places to survive and they kind of form together like a group. And the girls were usually taken within a day. So they, when I was there, they said that a girl on her own doesn't 
make it more than 24 hours usually when she runs away um, because they're trafficked <clears throat> for sex. If they're lucky, maybe they're trafficked for something else like cleaning or more labor work, but usually it was sex trafficking. Uh, Sarah, um, this is like, uh, sorry to interrupt, like I just need to stop you here. It's just too much information, right, for us to uh, grasp. So my point here is, so as you mentioned, the human trafficking as such, why we are not able to stop us, is the law lenient? Is the policy that the politicians are not able to take a stand uh, to eradicate this or uh, punish the perpetrator and stop this once for all? Or is it like the mental health and the poverty and various issues uh, or the lifestyle of everything? Like people want something more and they end up in this. Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, right, it's not just about sex trafficking or uh, child uh, abduction or child trafficking, abuse and those things, right? Those are interconnected. But as you mentioned, the like, large portion is like labor trafficking, which is not even addressed by uh, many people. And they just assume that, oh, they are just giving you a job. Oh, what's the big deal, right? I just want to uh, focus on that, how that traumatized people and how uh, I'll, I'll touch upon it like later on, if you want to talk on that, the politics in Florida and the current news. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you clearly, you want me to boil down <laughs> what I'm saying, which I totally get. Um, to boil it down, uh, it's not as simple as just policies being made, um, but that is part of it. The, the powers that be need to care more. It needs to be more of an issue. Um, one of the FBI ride-alongs I did was six blocks from the White House. <laughs> People were would go on their way to work. Um, and pick up a girl and go to work. Uh, actually, the, the high time was about five in the morning, four or five in the morning. Um, it needs to be that the corruption in the government is addressed and the issue is addressed. This matters to people. So that's the first thing. It needs to become that this matters. Secondly, um, the mental health piece is important. So understanding the perpetrators, why they're doing this, um, getting them help because they're sick. So that would be the second piece. And then the third piece I'd say is consequences that people know if they're going to engage in this, there are very severe real consequences that will happen. And so don't do it because some people, they are attracted to things they're not supposed to do that in itself feel, makes them feel empowered. So I'd say the government actually caring a lot more and doing something um, more proactive, addressing the perpetrators and their mental health issues, um, because that's where the demand is coming from. At the end of the day, the, the people that, that are trafficking these girls, they're, they're addressing a demand. If there was no demand, this industry wouldn't exist. So the demand is huge. And the consequences to the perpetrators, um, the people that are doing the trafficking, and the people that are buying uh, the people, the the slaves. Uh, I mean, uh, how do we like educate the public? Right, as you said, right, uh, they are sick. Perpetrators are sick-minded people, and they somehow has this and using this vulnerable population and exploit them to do whether it's labor trafficking or sex trafficking, right? So how do we educate them, right? How do we give that mental therapy, right? So if this is like something no one will understand, okay, I am sick and I need help, right? Unless they commit, because if you are saying that, like, because I find that law is ineffective and punishing them and putting them in jail is not going to solve it, right? If I'm not no, wrong. You have to get at the demand, why this, which is the root cause, why is this happening? We have to look at the perpetrators. Um, and that is something that is not addressed so much. So how to do that? A lot of these people, th there's, there's a huge range. Some of them are very isolated and depressed, but some of them are high functioning people. Um, there needs to be 
in my opinion, major public health campaigns done on this. So for example, um, apparently in England recently, they initiated a big public health intervention for stocking. And on, on public buses, there's advertisements and they explain to people what stocking is. If you know you need help, call this number, but it creates awareness that, oh, this happens. Um, I know in the US there are things like in airports about trafficking, but it's misleading because again, people think, oh, it's just people that are coming in from other countries. Um, when I was in DC, what I learned, which was sad, was the vast majority are actually US citizens in the US that are trafficked um, for sex trafficking. And then otherwise it can be a lot of illegal people. So how to address it with the perpetrators? I would say public health campaigns that educate people on depression, isolation, pornography use, um, educate people on the facts and help to humanize it so that these perpetrators understand they're hurting people. These are not objects. These are real people. Um, so I would say a public health campaign that <clears throat> is very pervasive for people to understand the real facts of what's going on. And even if people don't like it, I, when I was in DC, I remember we tried to work on an initiative at the University of Maryland um, to have in hotels, like major hotels, although really any, but chain hotels, things on there, like how there's a no smoking sign, have a sign that that says about trafficking so people know, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on with hotels. And the hotels didn't want it. They didn't want it because they said it would upset customers, it would upset um, their clientele, it would make it unpleasant. And our argument was, well, what about <laughs> the smoking signs? So it needs to be that it is prevalent so people see that this is an issue. Um, if it's if it's in the grocery store that they're seeing a sign, if it's if it's in um, if it's in hotels, so awareness, I would say, and then the perpetrators also being given opportunities for help. Like if you suffer from addiction to pornography, if you suffer from um, sex addiction, or if you if you suffer from certain things, and people don't always identify as an addict. But asking them, you know, you call this number, you will get help <clears throat> because these people need to be rehabilitated. Yes, certainly. I agree to that point. Uh, so so one thing that came to my mind, right? So even with the current topic, right? So in Florida, the, the public campaign, how does this will happen? right? Because I hate to say this word, uh, farm laborers or people who do like uh, less paying jobs or not to call them as illegal as such like undocumented people right so if you uh, have undocumented people for more than 10 20 years here in the united states and different states are creating uh, panic by bringing these kind of laws and policies saying that like okay if you transport or if you employ them we are going to kick them out from the state right so the governor has brought that up like and from july even people will not have driver's license. All those issues are there. Like how this is going to solve the problem, right? They are going to be more trapped into these human trafficking ring, right? To be safe and continue to live. What, what are your thoughts on that? Like any comments on, is it positive or is it bad? Well, that's another very challenging area. Um, something I know that... I think a lot of European countries do that I think is, is very interesting saying we should all do this, but I'm saying that this is one option I've seen be helpful is when people come in to the country, giving them temporary um, ability to, to work. Uh, so <clears throat> like, let's say someone could come in for three months and then they can work and then they have to go back and they can come back three months um, or six months or something like that. But I have seen that be one approach, uh, is more of like a temporary kind of, um, work authorization so that people are documented. They're, they're legally in the country. They're not afraid of being taken out, but they do know that they'll have to leave the border, then come back. Um, 
I don't know if that's a solution, but that is one way that I have seen be helpful in terms of all the people now that are illegal. I know a lot of them are very understandably afraid. Um, and, and they are the most at risk. They're, they're very, very at risk, uh, for, for this kind of stuff. We would have to come up with some kind of, some kind of policy to limit the people that are able to come through the borders and then address the people that are currently here in the U S that are illegal. And I'm not saying make everybody legalized, but I, I am saying have everyone be documented on some level because when people are undocumented, it allows the trafficking stuff to thrive. Um, and you have people that are trying to come through the border all the time. And what's going to happen to them? They don't know. They don't know that they're at high risk probably of being basically slaves in the U.S. Um, but I would say, I think looking at temporary work authorization and also looking at ways to address the illegal immigrants we currently have, address this issue, doesn't mean make everybody citizens, but maybe give everyone some type of documentation um, to really stop this trafficking problem. Because all we're doing by allowing all these people to be illegal, um, we're kind of helping the trafficking industry, honestly. So those are just my thoughts. I'm not yeah, sure if that absolutely. absolutely. Uh, again, uh, so there is no one point solution, right? So on a case by case, right? We had few people calling in, they uh, need help as a victim or as a um, person who is looking for some solution to these kind of problems, right? They tell the story like, it amazes me like all the time, right? Even currently we have few people like called in. They said like, I'm on a visit visa, on a business visa, and I can stay here for six months. But I was saying like, excuse me, you are not allowed to work, right? You came on a business visa and visit for pleasure. Uh, you have the money you spend and you leave. That's the rule. And if any employer is giving you a job and sponsorship, then you can come back. But he is saying that like I'll or oh, if I overstay, what happens? Can I file for asylum? So this, that, and all those things they are trying to make themselves into an un undocumented. I hate to say that like why do we need to make them illegal, right? Because the hope they have is okay. I can make money from uh, somehow working with the traffickers and staying with them. And one of our uh, survivor like. Uh, he, his story is like amazing. He was working here for 18 months illegally and without getting any paid in a restaurant. And then like he just realized that he's trapped and then he came out. So that kind of story like uh, tells a different, again, as you said, right? So there is two sides to it. They are desperate in need of some prosperity in their life. That's why like they are taking that risk and or staying and becoming illegals. So basically we can't do anything about it, right? So what what can we do, right? Because they are taking that risk. Yeah, they are taking the risk, but I also wonder how much people know that that's going to be their situation. Um, and that's another question is, do people really understand Um I think that the movies have unfortunately done a great disservice that there's a misconception that I've come across, at least that people might think, at least in the past, if you come to the United States, it's all wealth and everything's great. It's some sort of paradise. Um, it's wildly not true. There's a lot of problems. <laughs> and um, part of it is people's, I wonder, their misconception of what they're getting themselves into if they really know i mean why would anybody unless things are really really bad why would anybody try and take all these risks to get to the united states just to be enslaved why would anyone sign up for that i don't think most people would and so i think there needs to be again like more education public health awareness yes, yes. sarah on oh. that right I, I just need to stop right so we are mm -hmm. running a campaign in our uh, stop now as a sponsored one through one of our sponsors 
uh, with the victim stories as a survivor they said like they came on a legal uh, visa right it's called h1b visa and they become a victim right because big corporates are lobbying and bringing in people in this visa even people who don't get that visa are brought in on business visa b1 b2 and uh, temporarily for six months they are being forced to work here in big corporates and then they go back and they get paid in the foreign currency in their own country so these kind of things are happening silently behind the scene and nobody talks about it and people who come through those visas are being exploited so much as a labor trafficking victim, right? So they just don't, they are so afraid to even share the story, come public and also fight against it because they know that like they cannot because the legal system, as you said, right? The country is so messed up and it's only for the rich. If you are poor, like it's so hard like to get even a pro bono attorney. And then like uh, the whole thing about, as you mentioned, right? About the shame, guilt, and also their mental health and the trauma, how, how they are going through. Because most people view that like, okay, I'm in a dreamland, living an American dream. I've got, got into America. Everything is good for them, like for their family or for their friends. But back there, if they come public and say this out, it's a shame for their country and for their uh, friends. So that's why like they say like, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. Let me suffer or handle it the way I want to and they go through that trauma again and again so uh, so I just want to again we are running out of time so I just want to ask about your uh, thing right that you are doing uh, with mindfulness or meditation whatever that is so how does that came into your uh, concept right yeah um for mindfulness um that came about because I've seen it'd be so healing for people to be able wherever they're at. And I, I actually started um, different mindfulness groups when I worked um, with rape crisis, when I worked with survivors of violence, when I worked with human trafficking victims, and it can help them to bring them into the now, to be in the present, to feel more safe. It can help to have some peace when they've been through a lot. And there's different types of mindfulness practices. Um, I, I really like self-compassion mindfulness practices for people that have been through a lot, or we also did like a gentle, mindful um, yoga type of a class. But I will say the worse the trauma someone's had, the more you got to go slow and careful because I've seen situations where we do five minutes of meditation and someone is flooded with bad memories. So we, we don't do that with them. Um, we do other mindfulness practices. There's a lot of different ones you can do that can help them bring, bring them into the present moment to feel safe. Um, and in terms of like longer term practices, um, I've seen that people can build and build and build and it, it gives them a sense of something that they have some power over that they can do any time of the day that they want. So no matter what's happened to them, they, they can always have mindfulness, um, wherever they go, they can always have that moment to be present with themselves and nobody can take that away from them. Well, uh, I think, uh, with that thought, we can sign up, uh, sign out. Right. I, I mean, uh, I don't know how we can do that because, uh, if even for me, right. When I interview people, victims or, uh, ask these kind of stories, I, I feel like not just compassionate so it's kind of a burning uh i don't know how to put it i get enraged by like why are we as a humans like do these things right horrible things to other people and suffer so much and if you are going to say that like it's much easier with the mindfulness practice and meditation and everything can be solved i would love to hear more and no. maybe we can talk about it like in part two and uh, uh, and that way, like we can focus on uh, providing the solution for individuals, right? So it is always individuals case by case. We we can talk about it uh, overall as such uh, the human trafficking and abuse and all those things. But when it comes to uh, life uh, philosophy kind of thing, right? So it is always individual focused. 
So Sarah, like any final thoughts or comments for our audience and anything like you want to uh, share to the audience as well as make a shout out how they can reach to you, all those things. Please mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, yes, I, I'd love to continue on uh, talking about the mindfulness, but I will just briefly say mindfulness can help the perpetrators become aware of what they're doing. Um, mindfulness can help give a sense of humanity and peace and a little bit of power back to the victims. And one of the things mindfulness does, which is really powerful, is it helps us to better see our humanity in each other and why we hurt each other is because what I've seen at least is people are, can be just thinking about themselves and they use other people like objects. But when you practice mindfulness, you start, you start to see these are people I'm hurting people just like me. Um, I can be found at uh, my website, uh, www.drsarahspowards.com. Um, also uh, at happinesslearned.com, which is a website that I just launched. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. It's been amazing. Again, I would love to have you back again. We will talk more. Thank you all for watching. Okay. Thank bye. you so much. And bye for now. Okay. Bye for now.